In the year 1997, the future is in chaos and turmoil. Mankind is on the brink of extinction. Brave survivors band together and build a time displacement apparatus to receive a signal from a parallel future. This transmission is the Boondicott. the official podcast of bundablog.com the podcast that retains all of the members of our inner circle we are unbroken <laughs> i am your host with the most steven and with me today is our podcast non-binary champion of the world d-rock in the house d-rock in the house and we are continuing our AEW enjoyment and coverage on this episode of the Thundercast. Yes, our our very our super consistent uh, AEW coverage. <laughs> and we're here to talk about the AEW Dynamite from February tenth, two thousand and twenty-one, which. Uh, is interesting because this has been like basically AEW has now been around for over a year. And what was the first first dynamite? The first dynamite was October, 2019. Okay. So they now have like a full year's worth of storylines that have built up. Mm -hmm. We've established, um, I really feel like now with this episode of Dynamite, they're done establishing the the new stars that they have, and now they're ready to push those stars forward. Stars mm-hmm. like like Sammy Guevara and MJF, and and clearly Darby Allen. And we're I mean we're even seeing them starting to like move on to the next generation of new stars that they're trying to kind of push forward a little bit you're like in the last few months or so we've seen you know top flight and unacclaimed and uh unacclaimed the acclaimed come on acclaimed, the, i thought it was unacclaimed no no no. they're the acclaimed i, I thought that was a bird <laughs> unacclaimed is better i think the john cena guys um and who well there was a uh and and like private parties starting to get more of a push and well, actually, they didn't really do anything on this episode, but they've been doing a lot more with Hardy and stuff. So and and obviously they're using Private Party um, on Impact. So they they literally have Private Party as a as a commercial for AEW wrestling as a, a booked talent on Impact. Yeah, and you have like brand new guys that are well, at least brand new to. To, to people who only watch Dynamite, like Lee Johnson got a big spot this week and and stuff like that. So Well, we'll get really... to Lee Johnson. Yeah, we'll get to that. We got to start with uh, the start of the show, Darby Allen versus um, Joey Janela. One thing, uh, since the wedding last week, I've mm-hmm. been watching Kip Sabian's YouTube channel and and checking out to see what, you know, because even though Kip Sabian has been on Dynamite, like, he doesn't really have a personality that I could put my finger on. Yeah, he's he's just kind of a dick. And we, we haven't really seen him wrestle that much on on Dynamite. Like, especially recently, I can't remember the last time he was like in a match. No, it's uh, it's been at least three to four months since we've seen him wrestle, if that, on Dynamite. Right. Yeah. 
Although I think he did have a tag match with Miro in the last couple of months. But yeah, I feel like yeah, there was a tag match in there somewhere. But even in that tag match, I barely remember seeing him wrestle because it was just right. about Miro getting the hot tag and destroying everybody. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I find it interesting that uh, fun trivia, in case you didn't know, Penelope Ford, before she married Kip Sabian, she was attached to Joey Janela. And oh. did many a tag match with Joey Janela, and they were an actual couple for huh. quite a few years. So I'm oh, wow. very curious if that storyline will ever come back up in Dynamite, right. because that 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 seems like like something that would make a good Kip Joey Janela feud. It would, it would, and like you know the the fact that Joey Janela hasn't been given much to do at all since you know pretty much since AEW started like he had that one the only thing i remember him that, that that's like memorable that sticks out in my mind is he had that one match with moxley that was moxley's first match the like hardcore match i don't remember anything that he's done since then other than like teaming with sunny kiss for a little while but i don't remember like any there's no like memorable moments from that either so like it would be good to have him finally kind of get like an actual story or something he had the feud with with moxley for a little bit so that they could get some some hardcore matches between them right early on but they haven't really used the character and and now this is the second match he's had this year for a title belt Mm -hmm. um before he challenged uh Omega to the AEW Championship. Now he's challenging for the TNT title, which it, does he have a record to even support this? Yeah, this standing. That's, that's the that's these are the times when it's like you know they 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 keep talking about how you know wins and losses matter in AEW and like you know for me like. I I I kind of like it when they don't make wins and losses matter too much cuz when you do that you like rob yourself of the ability to book things that you want to book yeah. because this person happens to not win very many matches so a guy like Joey Janela like has a lot to offer I think and you know in in a case like this I'm kind of okay with them they, not really have much basis for him being getting they, a title shot. They did frame it as Darby is offering him this opportunity and that Darby <clears throat> wants to see him. That was on the, the road to Dynamite this week. Um, That's always an effective like, reason to have a match like that that seems like something that somebody doesn't deserve. If you you know you can kind of appeal to champion's discretion, like they can pick whoever they want to fucking defend the title against if they want to. So, and they had a pretty good match. It was it very very physical. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that there was uh, you know, it didn't go on too long. It was a nice healthy competition for both of right. them. Um, I don't think it made Joey Janela look that good. <laughs> Still, yeah, just can't get into Joy Janela. Yeah, like his his aesthetic just puts me off. Yeah, I I mean I I felt like he he looked pretty good I thought in this match and I think he got a pretty decent rub out of it. I'm also not like the world's biggest Joey Janela fan necessarily, but I feel like this match kind of was something that he really needed. Uh, after months of not really doing very much. And I think it, it it accomplished that goal fairly well. And I think Darby is also like a great opponent for him to really, he kind of plays to Joey's strengths and sort of can, can, can uh, draw attention away from his weaknesses uh, of which there are many in my opinion, <laughs> um, but I liked it. Also, I think that Darby with the TNT Championship, I think his his physicality is is amazing. Mm-hmm. His his matches are 
freaking outstanding, the type of bumps he's willing to take on his body. I believe there yeah. was a bump where it looks like he goes head first into the the side of the mat on the corner that he mm-hmm, went yeah. like the top rope down head first. And that looked like it should have killed him. So right. I was very I'm very impressed by by him. Uh despite yeah. the fact that he's a smaller guy, he fights in a way that makes you forget his size. Yeah, that's that and that's key, you know, like for a guy who's so undersized like that, um he it's it, he's almost forced in a way to have to take these kinds of big bumps and kind of be you know, he has to he has to establish himself as a guy who can take all that punishment to be believable as a champion in any way because that's the only way a guy like that it, it could be believable could believably win could believably beat like a guy like Ryan Cage for instance is to be the guy that will get up from just anything who will who can take all the punishment and still coming come at you and also who's willing to use his body as such a violent projectile in so many ways i mean his his tope suicida is like head and shoulders above anybody else right now like he just he's like a rocket shooter he just like throws his body with complete reckless abandon uh the only other person i can think of who's even close or pretty close would be phoenix he has that 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 like flipping tope suicida that he just like barrels into people but those two guys are far and away the best at that that tope suicida and it's the, the it, it creates such impact and they do it in a way that like somehow they don't kill themselves even though phoenix like i swear to god he's gonna like break his leg on the fucking barrier one of these days because he keeps on hitting the barrier with his legs really hard every time he does that but i digress <laughs> is is there any wrestler in AEW particular that you would like to see work with darby man like everybody i mean he's such a perfect guy to go up against big guys he's a perfect guy to go up against guys guys like joey that aren't like the the world's most technically sound wrestlers um him uh darby versus Pac would be a fucking super good match uh i feel like he's a great matchup for just about anybody because of his ability to take those bumps his ability to use his body, what little weight that he has in such a such an incredibly physical way, he can kind of go toe-to-toe with anybody and make them look good. I'd like to see Darby versus Lance Archer. I think that would be a pretty yes. good match. Absolutely. Yeah. That's one that's another one like I mean, I, I liked how they did the the Brian Cage match and kind of found a way to make it like just a little just just believable enough for him to pull off the win. Him facing off against Archer, like they would have to work real hard to make people believe that Darby Allen could beat Lance Archer. Um, although, and and to the point where I think if they did face off uh i would i would highly doubt that darby would come away with the win um which wouldn't be the worst i mean lance archer as tnt champion would also be awesome so yeah i would love to see that match i'm also curious to see because like technically darby allen's a baby face right now Mm -hmm. and kenny's a heel i wonder if they're purposefully like one is going to be a title holder is going to be face and the other title holder is going to be heel you know that's interesting that's an interesting if that's purposeful booking on their part or not i don't know yeah. no that's an interesting question next up i believe that uh john moxley had a promo oh yeah that was pretty pretty fantastic yeah i mean he that's just kind of it's become like a staple on dynamite at this point that oh john moxley's gonna do another fucking awesome promo it's like it's almost boring at this point but he's so good he's just so good on in those promos yeah my favorite part was that he ended his promo by telling kenny omega and kenta 
good luck with that, dudes, in regards to beating him. <laughs> um, yeah. Then I believe soon after was the inner circle and uh, Sammy and MJF. Yes, yeah, was the next thing I think, yeah. And MJF trying to incriminate Sammy in an audio recording. Right. And then Sammy catching him and throwing his phone and then attacking MJF's ribs. Yeah. Well, he punched him in the stomach and then MJF, like, turned that into, oh, my God, I think he broke my ribs, which was hilarious. MJF is just, like, his character work is, like, on another level right now. He's so good. Yeah. And then watching him sell the ribs in the match was just hilarious. Yeah, so hilarious. Oh, my God. Because he's playing it like a wounded child. It's just amazing. Yeah. Um, so that, I, think, oh. I, I did find it interesting, you know, maybe maybe it's just, like, there's a lot of... There's a lot of things that happen in wrestling that tend to trigger like a sort of Pavlovian response from wrestling fans. And so when MJF accused Sammy of trying to take over inner circle and Sammy like sarcastically admitted to that he was, that that's what he was doing, you know, but I mean, part of it was, yeah, he wanted to get him like on, he, he wanted to get audio recording of him saying that, but there's also a lot of times in wrestling where those little statements can come back to like reveal themselves as sort of subconsciously true. And so I'm wondering if we're going to, if that's the last we're going to hear about that, if maybe in some like roundabout way, Sammy actually is trying to take over inner circle and that maybe we could see in the future, you know, obviously eventually we're going to get Sammy versus MJF. But I wonder if we might see when they finally hook up that like all of inner circle other than like Jericho comes to his aid and like they start a new inner circle without Jericho and MJF. Um, the outer maybe, circle. maybe even Wardlow. You could create a context where even Wardlow would turn on MJF. They've been teasing that for a while, but they haven't really referenced it in a while. So they would have to reference it a little bit more, but if what you're saying is true and they're building this towards MJF and Chris Jericho being kicked out of their own group, the inner circle, I would I would love that. That would be hilarious. Wouldn't um, it? It would and, be so hilarious. And they've they've teased that Sammy's been uh, you know, on the fence about this decision since the start. Right. Um, so it's it's natural now that, that he's ready to break. I just wish that the inner circle had actually like done things as the inner circle to show how impressive they are in AEW because all they've done is like win a couple matches. They haven't really, you know, built the dynasty that they have, you know, professed that they are mm-hmm. to become yet. They've really, I mean, the only title that they held was like, doesn't even really count because Jericho was already the champion when he formed the inner circle. And that was the only title that's been in the group this whole time. I think, I don't think anybody else has had anything nope. at any point. The only thing was like tag titles, but I don't think the tag titles have ever been in the inner circle either. So yeah, they really haven't like accomplished very much as a group, which I guess I kind of have mixed feelings about they've kind of become more of a comedy entertainment group at this point. But, you know, if you're, you know, if you're uh, uh, Santana, Santana and Ortiz, or if you're Jake Hager, remember Jake Hager is like championships, you know, like, he, well, so what you like, you're not doing that. So like, shouldn't you be, you know, dissatisfied and like want to like change direction because you're not really doing anything effective. Arguably, the elite and the nightmare factory have done way more with their members. Oh, yeah. yeah, by far. Yeah. 
than DMT has. Yeah, they've they've had. I mean, within the the like the numbers of their group, they've had all the titles. You know, at one point or another. <sighs> um. So then, what happened next? Cody, Cody, and Lee Johnson versus Peter Cody Avalon. So versus Peter Avalon and Cesar Bononi. I had to look that up. <laughs> to me, it looks so stupid that Cody comes out by himself, and then his friends have to enter through a side door. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of weird. And it, uh, yeah, like he really. Why can't I they mean... just walk in behind him to his music? Why can't they stand in that area with him? Why they is that Cody they, Rhodes only? They do so many things to, you know, make the people who are executive vice pre uh, or executive executive producers not look like they're like aggrandizing themselves. And then Cody has this fucking entrance that he does every time, where he's like, he's the only one that gets to come out of the 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 giant like apparatus in the middle of the stage he has this big entrance and now he once upon a time had my favorite entrance music now he has my least favorite entrance music that snoop dogg remix should have been a one-time thing for this the episode that he was on and that's it because it sucks so bad and i'm so sad that they ruined his fucking awesome entrance music I hope that when the Go Big Show stops, stops, then they'll they'll stop that music. Hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah. It's just it's so bad. It's so dumb. Um, but the match was really good, actually, and it's interesting because at the time I was thinking, wow, Cody did such a great job of staying out of the way and letting everybody else in the match shine. But apparently, it's actually because he ha he was injured. At match he had a actually torn rotator cuff oh snap. um according to, according to AEW and supposedly and it's they they said it won't affect uh his ability to to be in the match at revolution with Shaq so that's good but also kind of sucks so he's he's kind of rehabbing right now so so it sounds like this but, it sounds like this match with Shaq is like the most doomed match in the history yeah, of I know, right? matches. Like, you, you build it with Brandy. Brandy gets pregnant. You can't even get Shaq to show up in Jacksonville. Right. It's And, and you've been doing it for, like, four months now. I know. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah I mean, from the very beginning, you know, I, I put a lot of trust in AEW because they've earned it. And so when they first started doing this thing with Shaq, I was like, I am very highly skeptical of this, but I will, I will, you know, let it, let it happen and see what happens. And at no point have they done anything to give me any more faith in this storyline than I had at the beginning. And yeah, I don't know how it's all going to come to a head at Revolution, but I have like less than zero interest in this match as it stands. Um, I thought that Lee Johnson looked looks pretty great. It was a good coming out match for him as a winner. Yeah. He um, did look I, great. I also I also dug Cesar Bononi. I liked his size. Mm -hmm. I thought he was a nice change of pace to AEW wrestling. I liked his his fighting style. Definitely, I, I thought he was pretty good. I thought he was pretty good. I thought he was worth dynamite. Yeah, I mean, I really like the fact that this match really featured those two guys. Uh, even Peter Avalon didn't do that much. It was mainly these two guys, which is good. That's, you know, you should be showcasing the future and instead of, you know, having Edge win the Royal Rumble, but I digress. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, well, Lee Johnson looked great, especially. <clears throat> um, he, I also thought he showed some pretty good charisma on the mic in the post-match post, ma post -match interview. <clears throat> and there was also something that I didn't really notice when I was watching it, but I, I actually was reading about it online, that 
in that promo, he kind of snubbed QT Marshall when he was like thanking everybody. And then it wasn't, it wasn't very noticeable, but QT Marshall kind of got confused and then was a little bit, not too upset, but a little bit upset. And so apparently that's going to be starting a new feud now between Lee Johnson and QT Marshall, which according to Dave Meltzer, which, you know, I always take anything he says with a little bit of a grain of salt, but he says that that feud was Cody's idea. So that should be interesting to see where they go with that. So you're telling me that now that the inner circle is feuding amongst itself, yeah. that now the nightmare family will be in a feud against itself? Yeah, they you know they're they're jealous of all the all the you know inter inter interfeuding. So they're like, no, we gotta we gotta get some of that. Guys, we gotta keep track of each other's storylines. Come it's on. It's not a real stable unless some some people are fighting with each other, right? Oh my god. Uh, yeah. that's ridiculous. This is gonna be like when they were trying to get MJF in the inner circle and they were also getting Will Hobbs into Team Taz at the same time. Right, yeah. So the next thing was uh the Young Bucks and Good Brothers, I think, backstage. Which uh, I'm pretty sure that was like pre recorded from last okay. week when the Good what Brothers. I think that was pre recorded. I don't yeah. know. It just didn't feel live to me. Yeah. I'm not sure. It uh, just, like, it, it, you know, I, it didn't do anything to sway me from hating everybody in this feud. <laughs> Both kayfabe and in the Young Bucks place also shoot hate for the way that they continue to book themselves. I just, I don't care about any of their reasons for being upset with Good Brothers because A, they're totally inconsistent and impossible to follow. And B, they're just being such huge dicks about it that like, I don't, I'm not really like, you're not getting me on your side in any way. I, I don't know if that's, what they're trying to do, like at, at this point, I I don't know what they're trying to do with this because it just doesn't make any sense. Young Bucks being champions, I think, is the most boring route for the tag team division. Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm not excited about it. No, and like you know, it's 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 kind of like they want to be, you know. I don't know if they want to be or if they just feel much more natural being heels, but they also seem to like still want people to cheer them. So they're acting like heels, but like also <clears throat> being screwed over and having, you know, legitimate issues that I think, sort of make I think them baby faces. I think what you're explaining is that they suck as characters on their <laughs> own TV show. They do kind of. I mean, like they're that the the their context in the show, the things that happen to them and, and the way they respond to them are babyface like, but and then, they act like heels. The the other thing that's confusing is that there's an underlying story happening where it seems like the Bucks are going to get kicked out of the elite. You know? Yeah, like... That but it, like the Good also, Brothers and Kenny Omega yeah. kicking them out. Yeah, and at the same time, it's so confusing that, like, you know, I don't even know. Like, I don't even know what... Yeah, I don't know. It's just... Yeah. it's It seems so... This is, this is like gosh. in... I feel like in Looper, when Bruce Willis is like, if we talk about time travel all day, we're both just going to get headaches and make diagrams of straw. <laughs> That's what talking about the Young Bucks is. Right, yeah. <clears throat> um, next up was the Hollywood hunk, Ryan Nemeth. Versus well, we have to Fox. mention first, we have to mention the, the, the short little, there was a short little page. Oh, yeah. Uh, hard interaction and then Paige like awkwardly ran into Dark Order and John Silver like started ranting like a like an 
ex-girlfriend kind of thing. Like it was really sad and like made me like really, really sad. It was poor John Silver. He's so like he misses he misses his Adam Page. And it's like, oh. But I like the fact, I like that they they, you know, that's a that's a that's a sort of a subconscious nod to the Dark Order isn't out of this storyline yet, you know, which I think is good. Um so I just wanted to mention that. They they didn't do the contract thing yet, though. No? No, we had not the contract later in the show. Okay. <clears throat> so, so yeah, there's the Hollywood hunk. Was that it? I'm so confused. I'm looking at our chat. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is Hollywood hunk's second week on Dynamite. Mm-hmm. Um, Ryan Nemeth is uh Dolph Ziggler's real life brother. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's. A fantastic wrestler. I think that he had a great match with Pac. I especially enjoyed uh, Ryan Nemeth's facials um, when yeah. he was getting the shit kicked out of him by Pac, and Pac was making him tap out. Yeah, when he was when he had him in the submission, those especially after the bell, those face facial expressions were really hilarious. Yeah, and I think that he's a good addition to AEW, and I'm excited to see. Uh, how they're going to use him in the future. Yeah. I thought it was a little odd just the fact that I don't know. I don't know if there was other things that he did, but the, he, I thought it was a little bit odd that he used the Dolph Ziggler, like trademark hesitation DDT that he always uses. Um, he also did a couple super kicks, I think. So I don't know if he's sort of, you know, using some of Dolph, Dolph's style in his wrestling. Um, you would think he would rather, like, distance himself no, from I that don't. comparison, but... He knows he's uh, Ziggler 2.0. He's got to embrace it. Like, you know, he, he can't... Yeah. He can't stop it. I mean, he when you're first breaking into the industry, it does make sense to kind of appeal to people's sense of the familiar in that like, way. If he wanted to be unlike Dolph Ziggler, he mm. would dye his hair differently, you know? Yeah. But he purposefully sure. is making his look similar to Dolph. Yeah, and and the the whole Hollywood thing cuz uh Dolph always was billed as being from Hollywood, Florida. So um but the other thing I wanted to say about this match is just how I, to me, Pac is like hands down one of the most proficient, accurate, technically sound wrestlers on the planet. And like everything he does looks so crisp and so good. Like, like at least like 95% of the time, nothing he does, barely anything he does looks like, you know, Oh, that was that. You know, that was obviously fake. You know, they, everything looks so precise and so exactly the way it's supposed to, and that's been the case since you know what he was in WWE. Is like I remember uh, when Neville had the match with Sami Zayn. That was like one of the one of the greatest matches I've ever seen in my life. And one of the great things about that match is how precise and how on point and accurate every single move that they did was and they did some really complex shit but it they never came even close to botching anything because he's just so proficient and it's just really impressive to watch yeah it's it it's also it's it's difficult watching Pac wrestle and not see him in the in the field contending for one of the championships I know. I yeah, mean, no, he's, so he's so clearly one of dominant. the best wrestlers. He's so clearly one of the best wrestlers in AEW and hasn't been in title contention for any title in a while. And I think it's 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 time, <laughs> you know? Definitely. Uh, next up, we have MJF and Jericho mm-hmm. versus The Acclaimed. The unclaimed. 
<laughs> the unclaimed no. luggage at the airport. The un- <laughs> Um, you 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 mentioned in our chat while we were watching the show that you dig the MJF Jericho mashup music that they've put together. I love it. I love it. There's 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 one spot where I felt like where I feel like they could add one more like but I love the mashup. That's like now that Cody's music sucks so bad, that's like my favorite entrance music in AEW. I just think it's it's suspicious to me that like when MJF tags with Jericho, they fuse the musics together. Like AEW sees MJF in a high enough light that he's the type of talent that you wouldn't just like skimp on his music. Right. And yet when Jericho was teaming up with as La Sex Gods with Sammy, it was just you come out to Jericho's music. You know, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that is interesting. That's an interesting comparison. It's definitely like adds a little bit of fuel to why you, why you can see why you know Sammy was so unhappy uh, all this time. You know, there's just one more thing that that he. I mean, that's kind of the whole. You know, the whole concept was that MJF became like. Or at least that's like what MJF says, right? In the in the earlier in the show, he's talking about like, oh, you know, you were Chris Jericho's darling, and now I've replaced you, and you're jealous, and blah blah blah. So there's something to that. Um, it was a good match. The acclaimed are really good um, yeah. at wrestling. Um, they, I, lo- I really like good. I like their gimmick that they're gonna try to use their boombox. To win the game, yeah, I think that's the really cool. Spot was really good. The way the way it was timed, you know, like the the timing of getting Jericho right as he's bouncing off the ropes for the lion tamer, uh, or the lion salt was was really well done. And I I I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure. I I felt that he should be kicking out of that. Uh, but he's Jericho. He's you know he's Le Champion. He's the goat. So I'll allow it. Um, he's the most experienced wrestler in all of uh, AEW. So he's is- gotta he's gotta know how to have a stronger head than <laughs> all other humans on the well, roster. He has, he has the most well developed instincts of anybody. Oh, I like so that. Being able to you know. Like his, his, having that instinctual ability to kick out, even when he's like out of it, like that. Uh, I, is I something. hear, I hear that when Jericho's wife is laying with him in bed and puts her arm over him, he he automatically kicks out in his sleep. It's just instinct. <laughs> that would be hilarious <laughs> if there's a way to like put that on on dynamite. I would be into it. Cuddles don't count anywhere. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so the big news from this, of course, was after the match, we, first of all, we got Sammy Guevara's music, which I can't remember the last time we heard Sammy Guevara's music when he came out. And that was kind of a subtle nod to like, okay, you know, you kind of got the, you got the feeling right away of, oh, Sammy wants to be independent now. The last time we might have heard his music on Dynamite is literally the first episode of Dynamite where he opened Dynamite fighting oh, yeah. Cody Rhodes and then has joined Chris afterwards. I really right. think we haven't heard his music since that first episode. If you, if you haven't watched AEW remember, Dark. I'm trying to remember if uh, what, the, what the entrance music was when he teamed with Hager for Sammy Hager. Um, but I don't think it was his. It might have been his. I'm not sure though. I can't. I can't remember. It was they. They. They lowered the volume of the music, so that Sammy Hager could talk to us. So it was difficult to hear. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We yeah, like we didn't hear the music, and also like we hear, like we never hear Sammy or Hager's music, so we like wouldn't recognize it even if we we did yeah. hear it. So like yeah. But so Sammy comes out to his music it, and does 
it's funny because when he came out to his music, the first thing I thought was the last time he came out to this music, he had panda shit on his head. He had panda, a stuffed panda <laughs> on his head. And I was like, wow, he gave up that whole panda gimmick right away on the inner circle. Uh, that's right, yeah. Um, but yeah, so he he comes out and he he did what I have been hoping that he was going to do for a while because I remember when he said if one more thing happened, because that stuck out in my mind because, you know, when somebody says something like that, it's pretty obvious that it's going to happen. But he said, if one more thing happens, I'm leaving Inner Circle. And something happened. And so I was like, okay, he's got to leave now. And it took him a few weeks of kind of teasing what was going on. And, but they finally pulled the trigger on it. And I was very happy about that because, yay, consistency. Hallelujah. My, my only annoyance with this whole plot development is that hypothetically if chris jericho is a rational human being he should watch aew dynamite he should see the interaction that sammy and mj have had and he should say this is suspect mjf what are you doing why are you breaking up our group wasn't he the one that, like, I forget what they were talking about, but Jericho was like, yes, we all watch Dynamite. Yeah. He, <laughs> He's the one that said that. They've opened that plot hole before. Right. And they've closed it, importantly. So now I feel like, like, where do you go here, Chris? Your, your tag well, partner is a dick. Especially now that Sammy has left the group, you'd think that if anything, that would precipitate Chris Jericho being like, okay, maybe I should sit down and watch this past week's episode and see what the hell happened. And it wouldn't, he wouldn't have to watch that much because it's early in the episode. So he can just see, it's like the second thing that happens. He can just see what happens and like, oh, okay. Yeah. MJF's like super suspect. You don't have to fast forward that far, Chris. Yeah, right. Exactly. It would be interesting if MJF and Jericho win the tag championships. And then that inspires Santana and Ortiz to leave the inner circle to challenge them. Oh the yeah. Championships. Or, you know, it could, it could galvanize them even like to have to finally actually have some championships in the group might galvanize them. Like if some of the guys might, you know, if some of the guys might be a little dissatisfied and thinking maybe I should leave this group is like really ineffective uh winning some championships might then you know convince them like okay maybe we we are actually stronger together and maybe i should wait this out at least for a little while it could go either way yeah for sure Um, close my door okay so it was a good development it's nice to see the story progressing and i think that if this is building to sammy Guevara versus mjf that's going to be a fantastic match it is it's going to be a really great match and i'm as good of a as good of a wrestling match as it's going to be and as good of a uh 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 sort of storytelling match as it could be with MJF. I mean, MJF's character work in the ring is excellent. So it could be really good from that standpoint as well. But it's also, um, I'm really interested in that match as a catalyst for, I don't know what, like, like when they have that match, I feel like what happens outside of it will almost be, as important as what happens in the ring based on like what what the inner circle what what their position is going to be in this match like what you know what what does pride and powerful whose side are they on what side is hager on what side is i mean even wardlow you could make an argument of like you know what side might he be on especially seeing how manipulative mjf has been and, you know, so it's, I think it'd be really interesting to see where the rest of the group goes based on the trajectory of 
Sammy, the, the feud between Sammy and MJF. What if Sammy and Wardlow just take off together and get married? What if that happens? What will America think then? It's fucking amazing. That's what I want to see. Yeah. Uh, I, I wish that the, the my only gripe with the, the storyline is I wish it had closed the show. I think it's it's a strong enough and it's a big enough plot point that it would have been a great close to Dynamite for Sammy just to say I'm quitting the inner circle and then walking out and then leaving their shocked faces. I think if it was and, on any other episode other than, you know, having Kenta in the AEW wrestling AEW for the first time, it should have I think I think it might have been better to save it for next week actually yeah. so that it could close the show because Sammy leaving inner circle is the biggest deal on this show other than like Kenta wrestling in AEW, but from us, from a, from an in universe standpoint, this was the biggest story development on the episode by far, and it should have closed the show. So I think it would have been smart to actually save it until next week so that you could have Kenta main event, but then also have this close the show because Sammy leaving inner circle should have closed the show for sure. And also just to note, MJF's face when Sammy was quitting the inner circle, he had yeah. like this like half smirk that he was trying to hold back. It was just yeah. some of the best wrestling acting in the world. He is, I mean, that's what I like. He's he's definitely like one of the best actors, one of the best like character work guys in like all of wrestling right now. Um next up. Was the pain uh, pain. was Marvez hanging out with Matt Hardy and Adam Page, and Matt Hardy slips him a contract to sign and has gotten Adam Page all liquored up, and Adam Page is like, "Sure, I'll sign it." And then when Matt Hardy turns his head, Matt uh, Adam switches the contracts and makes Matt Hardy sign a contract to which he does not know what it pertains. Right. And then Matt Hardy runs away like he just performed the biggest con job in the history of con jobs. Dastardly. <laughs> only to get out Bugs Bunnied by the Wiley Hangman page. Wiley Hangman. Yeah, so, so a couple things about this. First of all, the sheer idiocy <laughs> on Matt Hardy's part to be getting Paige, not only getting Paige drunk to sign a contract, which is illegal. You can't like, it's uh, that makes it like not binding to be intoxicated, especially like if you've encouraged somebody and pretended to get drunk and not gotten drunk to, to sign a contract under the influence of alcohol. And the only way for him to not get away with this would be to record the whole thing. And then he turns to the camera and, and talks about how smart it is that he got all of this recorded on camera for some reason. I don't know why he thought that was such a smart idea, but that's like proves that he did something illegal. And then while he's telling the camera how smart he was to have all this recorded, that's when Paige switches the contracts. And so now we have this hanging question of what did they sign? You know, did, 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 uh, did Paige join the Dark Order? Did Paige, did they sign a document releasing private party from their contract with Matt Hardy? Did they sign a match between Paige and Hardy for, and and if they did, what stipulation might there be for that match? Because that seems kind of like the, the, the most obvious way to go, I think. I would like to see the, that development that it's a match. And I'd like to see it that hangman, you know, he wants to move up in, in AEW rankings. And he knows that the best way to move up is to beat somebody who's been established and that's why he wants to take out Matt Hardy. Yeah, I think there also could be an element of, okay, you say that I need you to be successful. Let's have a match. 
if I beat you, then clearly I don't need you to be successful. If you beat me, then maybe I do need you to be successful. Maybe I'm not at that level yet. So there could be some sort of stipulation of like, if Matt Hardy wins, then Paige will join him, his, his whatever, you know, big money Matt, the thing that he's doing. Uh, but I hope it, I really, I really hope it does have something to do with Dark Order because I still really want Adam Page to join Dark Order and learn the true meaning of friendship. I also think that it would be, since Dark Order still seems to be in the storyline, maybe mm. it's a, a three-way match. Maybe it's Private Party and Matt Hardy versus Hangman and, and whoever else he's going to need from the Dark Order. And Silver and Reynolds, they've, they that was that was the team that remember they had that match right before he's turned them down where they had this amazing chemistry together and you thought oh they have to be putting they have to be having jo page join the dark order because look at this amazing chemistry that they have but then they swerved you and went the other way it was a fun it was definitely you know wrestling law you know antics it was just madcap but it was fun. The best thing about it is I don't know where they're going with it and I'm dying to find out. Like that's one of the things that AEW has been doing so well for for a while now is doing these angles and in, in, in a way that you don't really know what's going to happen next but you're you're dying to find out and that's how wrestling should be, you know. Yep. Um next up we have uh, I believe that Sting came out and Sting had been, you know, they, they advertised that Sting was going to speak tonight on Dynamite as they have on many other Dynamites. You literally didn't say a word. And Sting is just about to speak and Team Taz comes in and they've performed a kidnapping. There's been a lot of kidnapping on D Dynamite recently. This is like the third one. It seems like the theme of 2021 is kidnapping. Yeah, right. Like first it was Marco Stunt was kidnapped by by FTR. Then what was last week? I forget. Somebody somebody else was kidnapped last week. All kidnap wrestling. That's what matters. Yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. Um so they kidnapped Darby Allen and they put him in a body bag and they drag him across the parking lot in a body bag. That was brutal. Which is badass and cool, but where do you go from here? You have <laughs> kidnapped and tortured the TNT champion. You right. have repeatedly said how you're not allowed to be there at Dynamite anymore because of all the damage you've done at Dynamite, yet Dynamite keeps on providing you with a camera <laughs> to, to, to view all your antics, and now you've kidnapped somebody. Are they still going to own Darby Allen all week? Are they going to show how Darby yeah. Allen was released back into the wild? Like, right. I, want, I would love to see Darby Allen show up next week with like a shitload of road rash on his back, like it could be makeup, I don't care, but that would be super cool. Cause like my the, the I have a feeling that that body bag was probably like padded at the bottom, so as not, sure. not to actually seriously injure Darby Allen. And and all the only the thing we get is Stig running away with the bat. Right. What did what did Sting do? Did he get on a motorcycle? Did he have an action yeah. sequence? Like, you know, he like power walked away to catch this moving vehicle. <laughs> like, what do you think is going to happen? How is he going to say this? I want to see the story. Put it in a comic book. Do what you got to do. And, like, also, isn't it... Well, I don't know I don't know if they've established in AEW that it's canon that Sting has teleportation powers. But I feel like throughout his career, it's been pretty well established that he has teleportation powers. So why does he just use his teleportation power <laughs> instead of, like, walking fast... To catch an auto, a fucking truck. Although AEW has featured teleportation in the past uh, with Matt Hardy, apparently 
Tony Khan wasn't a fan of it then. Oh, and, really? And they've been doing... That's why there, there hasn't been any teleportation as of late. Was that... That's something that went on that he wasn't 100% on the fence about and then he didn't like how it played off. Which I agree with him. That bums me out. Like, I really... I, I like having those little moments of, like, supernatural in my wrestling, I think it makes it so much more fun. And like, you know, we're living in a post kayfabe era. So like, I like the, the, the little moments of supernaturalness. And I would be really bummed out if that was something that they wanted to get away from. Yeah, he was on a uh, Renee, Renee Young's podcast. And he was talking about that. Oh, yeah. yeah she's got a new podcast called the oral sessions. That, oh, okay. <laughs> That's Reggie really Peckett what... and the oral session. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's a choice. <laughs> I mean, I always wanted to see Renee do oral, but not quite like that. <laughs> oh, Steven. I had out. to go there. Come on. <laughs> she opened herself up for this. Yeah, well, she did, actually, yeah. John yeah. Mockley comes in and kicks my ass. No, no, Mox, no. <laughs> Which I've been hearing episodes of her show. There's an episode where she interviews John Moxley, her husband. Oh, really? And he had, they admit that when John Moxley um, headlined and at Madison Square, Madison Square Garden one time and won his mm -hmm. match, that they celebrated by having a hotel on Times Square and going on to the balcony at Times Square and making sweet love above the people. Oh my god, that's beautiful. Yeah, so it, it's a crazy podcast. They 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 admit some crazy stuff. That up here. Um, did you, what happened? Um, next? I think next was Kenny Omega golfing. Was that? Uh, that sounds about right. That was a very strange moment of the night. I it's like pre-recorded clip. It's just it, it just caught me off guard because Kenny Omega is like a video gamer has been his aesthetic. So to see him, you know, playing golf took a minute for me to be like, OK, he's going for like this country club style. Like, you know, he's an elite. Aesthetic. Yeah, I mean, I think I think part of that's that might be part of why they did it, that it's so it seems so out of character for him and. The whole, the whole kind of theme of that segment was that he is kind of not taking his matches very seriously right now. He's very cocky. He's very arrogant. He kind of feels like he's already the greatest wrestler who ever lived. And how could he possibly even get any better? So why does he need to, you know, prepare so hard for his matches even? Because, of course, he's the greatest wrestler of all time. So what does it matter? Um, I just found it an annoying because the way it was shot, he hits. a he hits. First of all, he's a golfer who got in a sand trap. OK, yeah. then, not very good. then he sh which, which indicates you're not a good golfer. Right. Then he shoots it out of the sand trap. Then he does his promo. And then while he's doing his promo, we can see that somebody is doing something to the golf ball in the background <laughs> and then Don Callis pulls out the golf ball and declares that Kenny Omega got a hole in one when we know Kenny Omega landed in a sand trap and <laughs> by the rules of golf did not get a hole in one <laughs> despite their cheating I mean that's that's also a very like cartoon moment right like that's a yeah. you know that's you see that all the time and like he saw he's like in the simpsons right when when mr burns would play golf and smithers would just like constantly cheat for him yes um but i i i will say i am loving cocky asshole kenny omega so much more than his previous like non-character basically like he just seems so much more natural at this like cocky heel kind of thing and it's just it's it's so much better yeah my only other thing is alex marvez is 
everywhere at all times with a microphone. That guy must sleep with a microphone in his hands just in case there's an interview coming up. Sleep. I think he just drives around looking for like AEW guys in public to be like, hey, can I get a statement about this? My, 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 one of my favorite parts of the whole segment was like at the very end, he was like, could I get a ride? <laughs> Which I thought was hilarious. It, 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 I hope it just gets progen- like like more and more outlandish that like Kenny's on a boat fishing and Alex Marvez rows over and is like, hey, I need a statement. That would be really good. I hope they do that. That would be hilarious. Or not even just Kenny, like anybody. Like you fucking like, you see like, you know, whoever yeah. young bucks on their private jet or some shit. I don't know what they do. And fucking Marvez is there for some reason. <laughs> They're hot air ballooning and fucking Marvez shows up with a parachute. Just like, hey guys, can I get a comment on what they said last week? They go to the bathroom and Marvez is in the handicap stall <laughs> ready to go. Like the that like the dark order when they were caroling, you like open the thing like hey. <laughs> um then I believe they had the was next up the, the women's women. match. Yeah. They had the, the first match of the women's tournament. Um it was do 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 Serena Deeb. No, sorry, Thunder Rosa and legit Layla Hirsch squared off. <laughs> Um, I feel like we've seen a lot of Layla Hirsch on Dynamite this year. They've definitely been using her a lot. I think so, too. Yeah, I, I'm not complaining. She's great. She's good. She's really good. Um, you know, I knew I knew Thunder Rosa was going to come out ahead because um, they've been right. putting her like a top talent in their division. Yep. Um, so there wasn't really that much uh, tension, I feel like, in the in the tournament to start. Mm-hmm. But I hope that we see more more parity. Yeah, I'm just glad that they didn't cut into the match like they always do at the 9.30 hour. They they figured out how to... They actually had picture-in-picture, picture and they they had, you know, TNT-related commercials, but they didn't cut away, which, you know, good for them. They figured out how to do this, <laughs> you know. For the first time in Dynamite history. Right, yeah, exactly. We so saw that, the entire women's match. Yay. That was good. Um, it was a good match, and, solid match. I'm a bit disappointed that, that a lot of the the Japanese uh, division matches are just going to be on YouTube. Yeah. Um, I, but I, I, agree. I agree with that. Like, at first I was thinking, oh, well, you know, they're not that much of a draw. But, like... That's that's a bullshit argument. Like I I really agree with the assessment that putting all the the Japanese matches on YouTube doesn't do anything for any of these people. Like we don't need AEW to be able to go on YouTube and see any of these people. You know, like it, the, the, the the if you're going to do this, if you're going to put half of the tournament in Japan, like feature some of this stuff on your on your flagship television show and give these women some publicity, you know? Like, why can't you dedicate one episode of Dynamite to right. this women's tournament? You love doing special episodes so much. Why not do an uh, all women's tournament special episode? That sounds like a great special episode of Dynamite. It does. Come on. I don't know. It's crazy. Damn you, Tony Khan. Yeah, and it's you know, and, like, I I really wish we could get to see like Maki Ito is fucking awesome. I've been looking at some of her stuff thanks to a friend of mine on YouTube, and she she's incredibly charismatic and an awesome wrestler. And I would love to see her on Dynamite, but you know they're just putting it all on YouTube. It's just one more thing in in a long line of things that makes makes it seem like they don't really have as much respect for women's wrestling as they do for men's wrestling. Um then I believe Jungle Boy had a had a promo. Yes. Which a was player. which was fun to see that Jungle Boy is now, you know, Jungle Boy is on that same level of talent as, you know, MJF and Sammy that yeah. they've been pushing him and establishing him and now he has his own promo on Dynamite and he said that he is going to make 
people his bitches. Yeah. Yeah, I've been I've been enjoying Jungle Boy more and more over the last uh, several weeks. I was I wasn't a huge fan of his, but he had a really nice spot in a in a battle royal, I think. A nice little hope spot and he had some nice spots in some tag matches. And uh, some really good promos and a and this feud with uh, with FTR has been really doing doing him a lot of good. So I'm really excited to see where he goes from here. Totally. Uh, and then to close the show, I believe we have Kenny and Kenta versus John Moxley and Lance Archer. In a what was the stipulation? Uh, falls count anywhere. Falls count anywhere. What a banger of a match! Yeah, super fun match. It just like from the word go, they just went all out. Yeah, John Moxley, you know, he loves doing these hardcore wrestling matches. That, that's been one of the main things that he's done on AEW is lots and lots of hardcore matches. And I think it really, you know, his uh, his creativity with violence, I think, was on perfect display tonight. Um, and these are possibly, you know, four of the best wrestlers that we've seen on AEW. Yeah, and sure. they perform like it. Yeah, definitely. And I, I'm a huge fan of Kenta. Uh, I was a huge fan of his... Um, I, I I started becoming more familiar with him when he was in NXT as Hideo Itami. Um, I was a little bit familiar with him before that, his work in Japan and the matches that he had with, with like Samoa Joe and Ring of Honor and stuff like that, um, but didn't get super familiar with him until recently. And he's definitely become one of my favorite wrestlers He's, he's such a, I, I love that sort of, you know, biggest little man persona that he has because he's so small, but he's such an aggressive physical wrestler that he, 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 he creates this context where it's totally believable to see him go to toe to toe with a guy like Lance Archer and, you know, those kicks that he does and the, the knees to the face that he does and the his kind of hesitation his trademark hesitation drop kick and that that double foot stomp at the end uh fucking blew my mind that was amazing cuz it came out of nowhere was one of the the things that was so cool about it cuz he was like Lance Archer was like about to power bomb him through the announce table and then he kind of like flipped out of it and then immediately just ran and fucking double foot stomped Moxley through table and it was super fun, super awesome and the whole match was really fun I've seen some people complaining about oh I don't want to see people wrestling on beds or whatever but like you know it was fun it was a fun match like and the you 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 also could tell the bed wasn't like an actual bed like it like broke in into pieces of wood when they slammed through it so like obviously there wasn't much padding on that bed and it looked impactful so you know i don't know what people are complaining about people will complain about anything in wrestling at this point but i, I thought didn't it was have, a fun match i didn't have a beef with pretty peter avalon's bed getting destroyed i also thought that they used the the kitchen extremely well yeah. I remember that we had a, a match in Dynamite that was the butcher and the baker. I'm sorry, the butcher and the <laughs> the butcher and the baker. <laughs> the, the butcher and the blade, um, fighting the young bucks in the in that very same kitchen. Right. And that was a very um, that was a very dumb match. That felt like a very you know sticky type of hardcore match and when they were in the kitchen it felt like a natural explosion of violence um yeah, and i liked yeah. how how they were like gravitating towards the metal tables and the things that would do 
you know, the most impact. Yeah, I, lo- I love the spot with the potatoes. And Tony Schiavone, you know, he's, he's on his game, and he had the great line, he potatoed him, <laughs> which is great, because he, like, took a potato and hit him with it. And he's like, oh, he potatoed him, which was really great. So, yeah, it's, like, it's just, like, such a fun match. And people that didn't like it, like, I think they just don't like fun, you know? Also, one of the best parts of the match, which I wish they had done more of, was watching John Moxley walk in with the IWGP belt, U.S. belt. Yeah, yeah. It was really cool seeing that title on Dynamite. And, you know, he he held that title at the same time as he was AEW champion. So he could have come out with both belts simultaneously. Yeah. We missed out on that. He's been IWGP U.S. champion, like, for most of the time that AEW has existed, I think. Wow. I can't remember exactly when he won it, but it was a while ago. Wow. He won it from Archer, too. He won it from Archer. Oh, and now I got to look it up because uh, I feel like it's been like maybe the entire existence of Dynamite that he's had that championship, but I'm not sure wow. exactly when he won it. But it's been it was a while ago. Um, let's see. He and we're gonna close this show with some research to figure out. He, he won the title at Wrestle Kingdom last year. So January 2020 is when John Moxley won the US title, and he has been the champion for over 405 days. Wow. So his entire run as AEW champion, which was I believe started in March, he he was the champion also in new japan wow yep damn uh it was a very good episode of dynamite uh one of the more consistent episodes i feel like like segment to segment yeah yeah everything you know if everything at, at the very least had a purpose and executed its purpose well and you know that's kind of all you need to do and everything was pretty entertaining also and you know some really big developments happened some big story developments some a lot of which we're kind of on the edge of our seat trying to like when wondering what's going to happen with with a lot of this stuff so i mean there's there's no better formula for a wrestling show than that i think you said it. Um, you can tweet us at Vundacast. Please uh, check us out on YouTube, Vundacast Productions. Subscribe to us on all podcast platforms. Um, any any last words for the for the people's D Rock? Um. No. Nope. I'm just, you know, the, nothing nothing related to anything that we've talked about. But just right now, I'm just super psyched for, uh, I'm, go- I'm seeing Jimmy World live in about 15 minutes doing Clarity in its entirety, which is my all-time favorite album. And then we got Joe Bob coming up at nine, which I'm also very excited about. So today's going to be a good day. We got a full Friday. Yeah. I've been your host, Steven. And I am your non-binary champion, D-Rock. And remember, kids, if you want to uh, do a successful contract signing, don't follow the letter of the law, don't get people drunk, and mm-hmm. if you do get people drunk, don't invite a camera crew to film it. <laughs> Good advice. Hey, Wunder. Hey, Wunder. Wundercast? Give yeah. it up for Wundercast, man. What an adorable name. You're listening to the Wundercast. What's up, everybody? This is JC David Frank, Green Ranger. You're listening to Wundercast. We got it.
subscribe to the Vondacast.